Look at the architecture that we have developed to land human astro or American astronauts on the moon. Look at the architecture. It is extraordinarily complex. In some cases, you know, it, 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 it hinges on us, me saying here today, that it is highly unlikely that we will land on the moon before China. And I'm gonna explain it in the next two minutes. <laughs> NASA recently released a two-hour-long hearing titled, There's a Bad Moon on the Rise, Why Congress and NASA Must Thwart China in the Space Race. Based on the title alone, you can already have some guess of what it's about. Events like this are usually pretty dry, to be honest. But this one actually has a former NASA administrator dive into some fascinating topics. China's growing space ambitions, SpaceX's Starship, and the future of the moon exploration effort. So let's take a closer look. In the opening moments of the hearing, a clear and urgent message was delivered. The United States is in a new space race with China, and the stakes couldn't be higher. If we fail, we risk losing far more than just a race. We risk ceding leadership in space to a geopolitical rival with clear and ambitious goals. China has made no secret of its intent. Its objectives are explicit, its progress is undeniable, and time is not on our side. This is a race the United States cannot afford to lose, they emphasized. China's capabilities in space must not be underestimated. From operations in Earth's orbit to an increasingly aggressive lunar program, China is demonstrating a relentless drive to achieve space dominance. Its recent milestones, such as the successful static fire test of the Long March 10 rocket and a promising early lunar lander test, show real momentum. If the United States does not secure a permanent human presence in space, that capability will fall to China. And with it, we risk losing not just technological superiority, but the trust and collaboration of international partners, many of whom will follow whichever nation leads the way to the moon, they said. Next to speak was former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, who voiced serious concerns about the complexity and feasibility of NASA's Artemis program. He went so far as to say, it is highly unlikely that the U.S. will land on the moon before China. So, why did Bridenstine express such doubt? He began by outlining the Artemis program. We have the SLS rocket, he noted, the most powerful rocket ever built. Yes, it has faced challenges. It's been expensive, plagued by cost overruns and delays. But those issues, he argued, are now behind us. It's done. We need to use it. He also pointed to the Orion crew capsule, calling it a shiny object in the program. Not just operational today, but becoming more cost-effective over time due to its increasing reusability. Those two elements, he said, are in good shape. Bridenstine acknowledged his past criticisms of both systems, delivered before the same committee, and made clear he's not shy about holding contractors accountable. But then he laid out what he thinks is the core issue. Quote, I will say what we don't have today. Here's what we don't have today. We don't have a landing system for the moon. And perhaps most damningly, he added, the biggest decision in the history of NASA, at least since I've been paying attention, was this. Instead of buying a moon lander, we're going to buy a big rocket. The core issue, as Bridenstine saw it, lies in the complexity of the current architecture, particularly the reliance on Starship, SpaceX's massive, fully reusable heavy lift launch vehicle. A variant of Starship is expected to serve as the lunar lander for both the Artemis 3 and Artemis 4 missions. While its potential is enormous, Bridenstine expressed concern that depending on such a complex and still developing system introduces significant risk and uncertainty to the timeline. We need to launch Starship. That first Starship is a fueling depot that's in orbit around the Earth. Then we need to launch, nobody really knows, Nobody knows, but it could be up to dozens of additional starships to refuel the first starship. So imagine launching starship over and 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 over. Dozens of times, no delays, no explosions, to refuel the first starship. Then once it's fully refueled, then that starship has to fuel another starship that is in fact human rated, which that process hasn't even started yet. By the way, that whole in-space refueling thing has never been tested either. We're talking about cryogenic liquid oxygen, cryogenic liquid methane being transferred in space, never been done before, and we're going to do it dozens of times, and then we're going to have a human-rated starship that is refueled that goes all the way to the moon. Now, when it goes to the moon, 
We don't know how long it can be there because it's boiling off the entire time it's in orbit around the moon. We don't know how long it can be there. But while it's there, we have to launch the SLS. We have to launch the Orion, the European Service Module. We have to have astronauts and crew all ready to go. And they have to, they have to orbit the moon themselves in that window, that window when Starship is around the moon, and then they have to dock around the moon, they have to transfer from the Orion into the Starship, it has to go down and land. When it's on the surface of the moon, Starship is gone, or uh, Orion is gone for the next seven days until it comes back around in near rectilinear halo orbit. So our astronauts are right now planning to be on the surface of the moon for a period of seven days without any way home. So one huge point Jim raises about Starship is the challenge of orbital refueling, a critical capability for SpaceX's long-term plans. It's true that this has never been done practically before, and because of that, there's still uncertainty around how many tanker starships would be needed to fully fuel a single mission-ready starship in orbit. But is orbital refueling really as difficult as Jim suggests? SpaceX CEO Elon Musk recently addressed this concern on X, stating that orbital refueling tests with Starship version 3 are planned for multiple attempts next year. While it's uncharted territory, SpaceX may be better positioned than anyone before to take it on. Elon said that since SpaceX is just docking Starship with itself, this is actually a much easier problem than docking with the International Space Station, something SpaceX already does several times a year. Although no one has successfully performed orbital refueling yet, the concept has been studied extensively for years. The primary barriers weren't a lack of understanding, but rather the absence of a company with the necessary resources and technical capability. SpaceX is the first to realistically attempt this at scale. The most promising approach so far involves generating a slight but continuous forward thrust from both starships, which creates artificial acceleration. This causes the cryogenic propellants, liquid methane and liquid oxygen, to settle at the rear of their tanks, simulating gravity. Once the propellants are settled, the actual transfer becomes far more manageable. By slightly increasing pressure in the source tank and decreasing it in the receiving tank, the fuel can flow efficiently through transfer lines. Another challenge that the former NASA administrator pointed out is getting Starship human rated, and whether that can happen in time to actually return humans to the moon, especially considering how complex the Artemis missions are. He also raised concerns about the huge number of launches, landings, and testing activities involved. Right now, the FAA is in the final stages of approving 44 Starship launches per year from Launch Complex 39A alone. On top of that, SpaceX is working on turning Slick 37 into another major Starship launch site potentially capable of 76 launches a year. That's a lot of rocket activity, and it could bring serious disruption to the surrounding areas at the Cape. He pointed out that if SpaceX hits its goals, we're talking over 100 Starship launches per year out of Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center. That means more than just launches. There will be constant testing, landings, and operations that could end up shutting down those facilities frequently. And that creates another issue. We could end up in a situation where there's basically one launch provider dominating the entire system. Interestingly, during the two-hour hearing, neither Bridenstein nor anyone else offered any specific solutions for the problems he raised regarding the lander. Due to all the technical challenges, Bridenstine said it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're trying to go to the moon first this time to beat China. The question is, what do we do, he asked. And I think one thing we can do is we can say, look, we're not going just to put flags and footprints on the moon as we did back in 1969 through 1972. What we're doing now is we're going to go, we're going to go forward to the moon. Mike Gold, I think, correctly talked about the gateway and how that could be basically our moon base around the moon. Um, and then we can have commercial and international partners join that moon base to be able to have access anywhere on the surface of the moon at any time we want. Bridenstine, the original architect of the Artemis program, essentially admitted that NASA may no longer have a chance to beat China back to the moon. Instead, he suggested that since we're likely to lose that race, we should reposition the gateway as the new high ground in space and declare establishing this lunar outpost in the late 2020s as the win. 
Does that make sense? Let me know in the comments below. Of course, I understand Bridenstine is trying to be realistic, or at least that's what he believes, but I've always disliked it when new ideas are dismissed just because they're complex or unfamiliar. That's not a helpful mindset, especially in space exploration. And not everyone shares Bridenstine's pessimism. Jared Isaacman, astronaut and former nominee for NASA Administrator, who testified before the same committee just months ago, responded on X with a more optimistic take. He wrote, With respect to the hearing, I do agree we should be asking why taxpayers have spent more than $100 billion trying to return to the moon over the last few decades and still face such a complicated journey ahead. SLS is extraordinarily expensive. Orion has issues. The suits are not ready. The landers are not ready. And for sure, there is a real chance China could get there before our grand return. I think that warrants congressional discussion, and I imagine if it could all be done over today, different decisions would be made. But Isaacman pushed back on the criticism of orbital refueling, saying, What I think is incorrect, in my humble view, is poking holes at the complexity of orbital refueling. Both Blue Origin's MK2 lander and SpaceX's landers depend on it. Private industry is investing heavily in the capability so it's not entirely on the shoulders of taxpayers. And when it works, it will change the game in applications well beyond the moon. If all we wanted was another Apollo-style LEM, that would surely have simplified things. But are we trying to repeat 1969 or pioneer the technologies that will extend America's ability to explore, discover, and defend in the high ground of space?